Thank you, everyone. We will, I want to recognize also we've been uh, present here by Council Member uh, Salamanca, Diaz Reynoso, Dodge, Menchaca, and Richards. Uh, good afternoon. First of all, thank you to the members of the administration for the delay. Welcome to this hearing of the City Council Committees on, on Transportation. I need Anis Rodriguez, the chair of the com this committee. Today we will be hearing testimony on 11 pieces of legislation relating to curbs and sidewalk. Please don't come to you oppose all of them. Be open to continue working and see how we can address those 11 pieces of legislation. They, have, they are focused on driveways, curb, cut, but first, well, I already acknowledge my colleague. Intro. Intro 131, introduced by Council Member Lander, will require the Department of Transportation to order a property owner to discontinue the use of a curb cut and restore the curb where the curb cut is inconsistent with the requirements of the city's building code or a zoning resolution. Additionally, it will require construction permit applications to certify that if construction will cause a curb cut to be non-compliant, a plan must be must assist to restore the code. Intro 285 introduced by Council Member Richards will require DOT to clean and maintain all meetings at least once a year and create a web-based system to track its progress. Next, we have three bills that I have introduced. The first, Intro 327, will require DOT to establish a core curb extensions program to identify intersections where in extensions may be implemented to enhance pedestrian safety and implement at least five curb extensions per borough per year. Everyone knows that 70% of the crashes in New York City happen in intersections. Intro 329 will require DOT to prepare a report detailing the condition of bridges, sidewalks, and ferries under the jurisdictions of DOT. Finally, my intro 330 will require DOT to provide a list of sidewalks for which it is responsible for moving snow or making repairs. Council Member Constantini, the intro 438 will allow property owners to paint authorized curb cuts. Intro 939 introduced by Council Member Holden will prohibit the police department from issuing a violation to a vehicle for illegally parking in a driveway unless a police officer first confirms that the driveway, driveway was legally constructed or modified. Intro 953 introduced by Council Member Heger will require property owners to correct illegally created curb cut, and if the property owner does not correct it, DOT will be required to do so and then recover the cost from the property owner. Additionally, community board will be notified of any application to create a curb cut within the community district. Council member Orridge, intro 1015, will require the Department of Buildings to within two days of receiving a complaint regarding a curb cut for which the department has not issued a permit to forward the complaint to the appropriate police department. Council Member Dodge, consider, consider, consider intro will require the city to paint curb adjustment to fire hydrants and bus stop in order to alert drivers to where they may not legally park. Finally, my resolution 103 will call on the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to widen the George Washington Bridge sidewalks. I now, if there's any response of this bill to deliver the opening statements. Council Member Dodge, you have no, you, no, Council. I would like to welcome the I would like to welcome the representatives of the administration who are here with us today. Thank you for being here and your patience. I now ask 
the committee counsel to administer the information and then invite you to deliver your statement. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, Con Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. On behalf of Commissioner Trottenberg, I am Leon Haywood, Deputy Commissioner for Sidewalk and Inspection Management, and I am joined with Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. I am also joined by Patrick Wheel, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs at the Department of Buildings, Oleg Chonowski, the Executive Director of Legislative Affairs at NYPD, and Deputy Chief Pilecki from the Transportation Enforcement District. Thank you for inviting us here on behalf of Mayor de Blasio to discuss the bills that before the committee today. First, two bills regarding the painting of curbs. The pre-considered intro by Council Member Deutsch, previously intro 623, would require DOT to paint curbs red in all bus stops and the distance on either side of fire hydrant from which parking, standing, or stopping is prohibited, which is 15 feet. I want to start by saying that maintaining hydrant access for a fire department and facilitating efficient movement for our city's many bus riders are both very high priorities on our streets, hence the importance of both of these regulations. DOT understands that the intent of the bill's sponsors is to make life easier for drivers trying to figure out where they may or may not park. However, DOT strongly opposes curb painting as a solution because of serious maintenance challenges and the potential for tampering, which has a significant impact on its effectiveness. To regulate the use of our many millions of feet of curb space, a combination of signage and rules is the most accurate, effective, and cost-efficient method to inform drivers where they are allowed to park. While it is universally understood not to park in front of a hydrant, Painted curbs are subject to being worn and scarred. Use of painted curbs is also susceptible to unauthorized tampering by property owners or others painting their own curb markings. Curb painting also conflicts with the preservation of historic bluestone curbs or the use of other distinctive curbing material, nor is it compatible with the use of bioswells. In addition, the lengths and location of bus stops and other parking restrictions are sometimes modified in these cases, signs are easier to relocate than painted curbs. For these reasons, DOT currently does not paint curbs to designate their use, and deals in doing so would require an entirely new set of specifications and standard and a new operational unit. With approximately 110,000 hydrants citywide at 15 feet on each side, this proposal would require DOT to paint nearly 3.3 million linear feet of curb and with approximately 16,000 bus stops citywide at an average length of 100 feet, it required DOT to paint 1.6 million linear feet for a total of nearly 5 million linear feet. All told, this constitute over 900 miles of curb, in other words, about the distance from here to St. Louis. As DOT previously testified in September 2017, complying with the requirements of the bill would cost several million dollars for installation and recurring maintenance costs of over a million dollars annually. This considerable diversion of resources for street painting operations would distract from our two vital Vision Zero priorities when it comes to markings, creating new safety projects and redesigns and refreshing our existing markings and thereby affect our ability to make progress on eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries. For all of these reasons, DOT opposes the intro. The second bill dealing with painting, cur painting curbs, intro 438 by Council Member Constantinez, would make it legal for a property owner to paint an authorized curb cut, which is currently a violation of the New York City Administrative Code on street defacement, including the curb. DOT conducts enforcement to, encourage this, to discourage this practice because it can be misconstrued to indicate where it may or may not be legal to park in contradiction to traffic rules and posted regulations and can thereby cause confusion and be subject to ab abuse. So DOT opposes sanctioning this practice. In the case of enforcement, our inspectors issue a notice of defacement to give the property owners a chance to correct the condition before imposing a violation. Regarding intros 131 by Council Member Lander, 939 by Council Member Holden, 
953 by Council Member Yeager and 1015 by Council Member Ulrich, DOT defers to the Department of Buildings Authority to approve curb cuts for private driveways, and we defer to NYPD on the enforcement of illegal parking in a driveway in violation of New York City traffic rules. For DOT's part, in the case of an unauthorized curb cut, Intro 953 would require us to issue a commissioner's order for an illegal curb cut and restore such a curb to our specifications within six months at the expense of the property owner, if not first restored by the property responsible. First, it must be emphasized that DOB and not DOT reviews construction documents which indicate that a curb cut will be created before issuing a permit. DOT also issued violations for illegal curb cuts and requires restoring the sidewalk and curb to the original condition. Second, while DOT understands that unauthorized curb cuts are a significant problem with effects on both the use of the street and on safety, meaning such a requirement within the time frame opposed would likely require a significant new contract and resources for DOT and should be weighed against all the competing needs of the agency to enhance safety and mobility and maintain our street infrastructure in good repair. Now, turning to some bills on cleaning, condition, and maintenance of our streets and other transportation infrastructure. First, intro 285 by Council Member Richards would require DOT to clean and maintain all medians once a year and create a web best system to track our progress. The existing division of labor among city agents for cleaning various city properties takes into account the similarity of various tasks to the other work performed by various agencies, ability of the personnel and equipment, and potential for each agency to integrate the cleaning of particular properties into their regular operations. According to this division of labor, DOT is responsible for 200 miles of arterial highways, such as the Bruckner Expressway and the Belt Parkway, and the 2,400 landscape acres of the New York City arterial system. At the same time, on our, on our street network, unlandscaped center medians, malls, traffic islands, and triangles are the responsibility of sanitation, while such areas which are landscaped are generally maintained by parks. DOT would be happy to discuss any particular location with the elect officials or community boards in collaboration with our sanitation and parks department partners to think creatively about available resources. However, taking into account all our existing responsibilities, cleaning every medium once a year as proposed is beyond the limit of DOT's current capabilities, and we therefore oppose this bill. Intro 329 by Chair Rodriguez would require an annual report on the condition of DOT bridges over a quarter mile in length, our ferries, and sidewalks under the exclusive jurisdiction of the department meaning those adjacent to our properties and on our bridges and overpasses. DOT already produces a bridge and tunnel annual conditions report as mandated under the New York City Charter. In addition to reporting summary information on the state of bridge repair in the mayor's management report. The Division of Bridges manages the city's capital bridge program, conducts bridge inspections and monitoring, and keeps the entire bridge network in a state of good repair. Our inventory includes all the iconic East River bridges, which are well over 100 years old, requiring continual care and attention. The remaining network of nearly 800 bridges includes the Harlem River bridges, the Belt Parkway bridges, and elevated roadways and pedestrian bridges serving the neighborhoods across the city, which are subject to the continuing effects of heavy traffic and rough winters with long cycles of ice, snow, rain, sleet, and de-icing activities. DOT conducts regular maintenance of its bridges to prevent decay, and our 10-year capital plan includes approximately $8.8 .8 billion for bridge reconstruction and major rehabilitation. DOT has a rich tradition of bridge design, construction, maintenance, and administration, and will continue to use its resources and attract additional funds to provide safe spans that meet the needs of all 8.4 million New Yorkers. While bearing in mind the information that is already provided in the Mayor's Management Report, DOT would be happy to discuss the goals of this bill when it comes to reporting on the condition of our ferry, fleet, and sidewalks at DOT facilities. Our Ferries Division conducts an extensive maintenance program to keep our fleet operating in excellent condition to transport 
over 23 million passengers a year with over 90% on-time performance. All maintenance is in, is in accordance with the U.S. Coast Guard regulation and the class standards of the American Bureau of, Sh of Shipping. The U.S. Coast Guard conducts quarterly inspections of vessels and issues a certificate of inspection without which the vessels cannot operate. The Ferries Division goes above and beyond what is required by the U.S. Coast Guard and maintains all vessels to the class standards of the American Bureau of Shipping. As you know, we are well underwear with the procurement of three new 4,500 passenger capacity OLIS class vessels, a major investment for the future that will allow us to retire some older vehicles. When it comes to sidewalks adjacent to DOT properties, we strive to maintain them in a condition free from defects. Our sidewalk programs typically repair over a million square feet of sidewalk annually through in-house and contract work. To enhance accessibility and mobility across every neighborhood in the city, under Mayor de Blasio, we have doubled our investment in this work from $20 million to $46 million annually, some of which is recruit from property owners. Under the program, we repair both sidewalks abutting one, two, three family homes at the expense of, owners, at the expense of the owner, city property, and city property. Last year, we repaired approximately 341 square feet on city-owned property, including both DOT and other city agencies, particularly the New York City Housing Authority. Finally, intro 330 by Chair Rodriguez would require a regularly updated list of sidewalk locations for which DOT is responsible for snow removal. These locations include step streets and pedestrian overpasses and walkways and sidewalks in our municipal parking fields and at our ferry terminals. As you know, in addition to these locations, DOT contributes resources to a coordinated snow removal plan for New York City, including general street cleaning and de-icing under the direction of sanitation during large snow events. DOT is happy to further discuss the goals of this bill with the chair. Last, I will discuss a Vision Zero related bill, intro 327, also by Chair Rodriguez, which would require DOT to install curb extensions at a minimum of five intersections per borough annually. Extending, cur extending the curb is a standard part of DOT's Vision Zero toolkit. We frequently employ it to shorten pedestrian crossing distances, enhance visibility, and as part of safer traffic configurations, and we appreciate your support for this proven approach. Last calendar year, we installed curb extensions, or as we call them, neck downs, at approximately 50 locations citywide. However, at any given time in a particular borough, we may be doing a higher amount of the kind of work involved in the creation of curb extensions while at other times, interventions may focus on signal timing or other treatments. And the amount of work we do in each borough overall varies in proportion of the size of each borough and the makeup of its streets. Under Vision Zero, we are reducing traffic-related serious injuries and fatalities by, the following, by following the data, utilizing the most effective and appropriate treatments from our whole toolkit based on our engineering judgment and dramatically increasing our productivity. So having to spend time and resources to follow a particular formula or evaluate treatments that may not be tailored is not helpful to the success. Bearing all of this in mind, we are happy to work with the bill sponsor on the bill. In conclusion, the ongoing management of our vital street network, including curbs and curb cuts, cleaning, snow removal, and parking regulation, as well as the maintenance of other transportation, transportation infrastructure, such as Staten Island Ferry and the bridges that serve as critical links in our network for millions of trips each day, are all vitally important. DOT is always striving to provide world-class streets to New Yorkers, and we look forward to continuing to work collaboratively with the Council to achieve that goal. After you hear from our colleagues, we will be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department of Buildings. I am pleased to be here today to offer testimony on three of the bills before this committee, introductory numbers 131, 953, and 1015. 
Introduction number 131 would require the department to order that the use of a driveway be discontinued and that a curb and sidewalk be restored where it finds that a curb cut does not comply with the New York City Building Code or the zoning resolution. It would also require that owners certify to the department that any proposed construction will not cause a curb cut to be in non-compliance with the building code or zoning resolution, and if such construction causes such non-compliance, that the curb and sidewalk will be restored. The department enforces both the building code and the zoning resolution as it relates to curb cuts. If construction documents submitted to the department indicate that a curb cut will be installed, the department ensures, through the review of plans, that any proposed curb cut complies with the building code and zoning resolution before issuing a permit. Additionally, when the department receives a curb cut complaint, the department performs an inspection, which includes checking for compliance with the building code and zoning resolution. Where noncompliance is discovered, the department issues a violation, and curing the violation requires restoring the sidewalk and curb if such violation was issued for illegally creating a curb cut. Further, as part of an application to the department to perform work, owners are already required to certify that they will comply with all applicable laws, rules, and regulations. The department's enforcement of curb cut regulations and existing owner certification requirements are in keeping with what is proposed in this bill. Therefore, the department does not believe this bill will improve existing processes. Intro 953 would require the department to notify community boards within seven days of receiving an application for a permit to install a curb cut. The community board would then have 60 days to submit comments and recommendations to the department with, the res with respect to such permit application. The department must then consider such comments and recommendations before granting or denying the permit. The bill would also require the department to conduct an inspection before issuing a per permit for a curb cut. Given the significant impact construction could have on New Yorkers, the department recognizes the importance of sharing information with the public. As such, the department has made enormous strides in improving the public's access to its data, with the goal of every building construction project having a clear and transparent status. Building on My Block, which is a searchable online database that is organized by Community Board for easy reference, allows users to search pro up by property address or community board to find major projects near them. The Building Information System, or BIS, or the DOB Now Public Portal, allows users to see the latest developments at construction sites of interest, including complaint, violation, application, and permit information. In accordance with the Open Data Law, the Department is also publishing daily updates to all job applications and permits on the New York City Open Data Portal, which allows users to access the latest status of any construction project or group of projects. As I mentioned earlier in my testimony, the Department ensures that any proposed curb cut complies with the Building Code and Zoning Resolution before issuing a permit. And if such proposed curb cut complies, it is obligated to issue a permit. While the Department work welcomes feedback from communities impacted by construction, it does not support delaying, a permit, delaying permit issuance for two months for construction work that can be performed as of right. The Department is also not supportive of performing an inspection prior to issuing a permit to install a curb cut. Allele curb cuts are typically installed absent department scrutiny and therefore without a permit. As such, performing an inspection prior to permit issuance would add little value and strain the department's limited resources. The department regulates the safe and lawful use of over 1 million buildings and 45,000 active construction sites at any one point in time. In addition to the over 100,000 complaints it responds to, the department performs nearly 190,000 development inspections each year. The department's mandate has expanded rather dramatically of late to include performing inspections to ensure that workers have appropriate safety training under Local Law 196, along with inspections to ensure tenants are protected from construction as harassment. The department estimates that performing an inspection before issuing a permit to install a curb cut could result in an additional 1,500 inspections per year. The department believes that it can effectively enforce curb cut regulations through plan exam and complaint response as is existing practice without performing an inspection prior to permit issuance. Intro 1015 would require the department to share curb cut complaints with the relevant police department precinct within two days of receiving such complaints where it has not issued a curb cut permit the location that is subject of the complaint. Last year, the department performed nearly 3,000 inspections in response to curb cut complaints, 
which resulted in the issuance of 504 violations. As a matter of practice, the department responds to every complaint that it receives, irrespective of whether a permit has been issued at the location that is the subject of the complaint. Further, while the department is not opposed to sharing information with the police department, the department fails to see how sharing curb cut complaints with them would be useful, particularly when only 17% of complaints result in the issuance of a violation. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, once the police department testifies, I welcome any questions you may have. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the council. I am Oleg Tranovsky, the department's executive director of legislative affairs, and I'm joined here today by Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki from the NYPD's Traffic Enforcement District. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, we are pleased to testify on two of the proposed bills which are of interest to the department. Intro 939 requires the department to confirm the legality of a curb cut prior to issuing a summons for violation of Section 4-08 of Title 34 of the Rules of the City of New York. As the primary law enforcement agency in the city, the department is tasked with, among other things, the enforcement of traffic laws, including parking violations. In carrying out these duties, the department emphasizes in its training sessions for both officers and traffic enforcement agents that they be certain that a legal basis exists before issuing a violation. The department does not want to reward illegal curb cuts, which take away on-street parking spots in neighborhoods where parking is already limited. However, TEAs do not have the ability to, to determine which curb cuts have been created legally versus those that result from illegal actions. There exists no easily searchable database available to make such a determination. Even if, a, even if such a database were to exist, TEAs, who are primarily tasked with the issuance of parking summonses, are not equipped with the technology, such as department-issued cell phones, to run such a check. Nor would it be practicable to require TEAs to travel back and forth to a precinct to run a check on the department computer each time they encounter a vehicle parked in front of a driveway. While the department supports the goal of this legislation and looks forward to working with Council Member Holden on this issue, the department would be incapable of complying with Intro 939 as written. Intro 1015 requires the Department of Buildings, when in receipt of a complaint for an illegal curb cut, to forward the complaint to the appropriate precinct within two days. This legislation presumably requires the complaint to be validated prior to it being forwarded to the department. It, however, raises the same concerns I have raised regarding Intro 939. Were the, were the department to receive this information, there currently is no mechanism to compile the data and allow it to be accessed by members of the service, particularly TEAs in the field, for the same reasons I've previously mentioned. Although we support the common goal of these bills, we have concerns with the legislation as written and ask that serious consideration be given to the operational implications and impediments we have highlighted today as we work together in developing a workable solution to the issues you have raised. Thank you, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, I would like to not, uh, recognize that we've been joined by Councilman Yeager and Councilmember Constantinidis. I have a few questions. And of course, intersections and sidewalk are priority for me, as I know that for the administration, so we've been working together with DOT and YPD with this issue, as also together we transportation and sanity and family for Save Street. But we know that we have a big responsibility to continue reducing the number of crashes in our street, most of them happening in intersection. What is the data when we compare crashes in intersections today compared to 2017? Crashes. I mean, all that information is compiled at our traffic management center and the uh, transportation bureau and it's reviewed at the department's weekly traffic stat meetings with the individual borough uh, commanders and precinct captains. So all that information is reviewed and discussed um, with regard to you know, high, profile, high profile locations, accident prone locations, 
Uh, we discuss engineering solutions, enforcement solutions, education solutions. So all this data, I don't, I don't have the accident data before me now, but I could tell you that it's gone over thoroughly by our chief of transportation. And similar to the CompStat meetings that are utilized to reduce crime, traffic stat meetings are utilized to bring accidents down. I, I would like to see by any chance you guys can try to get those data before we end this hearing because if we are discussing about policy, potential legislation and making arguments on why we should or should not move some legislation and one of the approaches intersections. And in the previous hearing, we also all recognized by DOT, NYPD, that still today 70% of the crashes are happening in intersection. I would like, first of all, to reconfirm if that number has changed from previous conversation or if still that number is the same. We can work on confirming that. Could you, Chair, could you clarify which bill from the last hearing that you're referring to that we were discussing? I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. You, you referred to the last hearing that we were. No, I say oh, that I'm sorry, I might in the past, as we've oh, been okay, having I'm conversation sorry. with the commissioners, the pre commissioner, and we're addressing a progress that we have made on Vision Zero, right. but we also recognize that crashes mainly continue happening in intersections. And as far as I recall, the average is that 70% of the crashes still today are happening intersections. Right, so you, we want to confirm that if it's okay. still at that threshold. Okay, we'll, so, we'll work on that. And, and I think it's important to know that information because if we want to maintain the same plan of working on curbs and sidewalk, then on the what data are we making, taking position because if the number is going down, then we can say, you know, we can continue the same pace Right. But if we know I that the crashes, I don't think we see. I don't think we see ourselves like slowing down a pace. I mean, obviously, since you've been chairs under this administration, the installation of curb extensions and, and our entire cool toolkit under Vision Zero has increased. Your threshold is 25. We just wanted to highlight that we've done 50, and you know, we we absolutely love how supportive you are of this efforts and want to make sure that it, it you know those those efforts stay in place. Um, we will check the stat as quickly as we can. I, I can't guarantee I can get it while we're sitting here, but we'll do it as mm -hmm. quickly as we can. We understand that you want to make sure that you can kind of codify that what's been happening will continue to happen. We just wanted to highlight that we, we, we've met the, the threshold that you're uh, proposing and gone way above that. Yeah. And I think that's why you're seeing the, the the traffic deaths decrease every every okay. year. So I, I think that again, if we can look at uh, any point that you can share with us based on yeah. the NYPD data on how are we doing today compared to 20, to last year, 2017, when it can crash it, so that I think that give us some ideas on uh, how should we continue with our plan. Okay. You know, I'm not in the business here to make the life better for anybody else more than pedestrians and cyclists. So even our ideas and all legislation that my colleagues are here addressing some initiative on painting the hard drive and the bus stop is not driver center, but it's about being fair. And by my case, you know, it, I'm happy that we can continue discussing our ideas on how to look at the intro 327 that will require DOT to establish a curb extensions program. It, because for me, it's about all of us. And I know that it's the community that advocates for individuals with disability. Like, how, what is our plan? Does, what is the plan that we have, in this case, DOT has, in coordination with other agency for the disabled especially during the snow. I mean, looking at this, I said, I mean, how do we, what is the plan that we have when it comes to intersection, curbs, and sidewalk to make them more accessible 
especially for individuals with disability, especially when we have the snow season. I'm gonna uh, 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 defer to Leon here to talk about our extensive curb uh, ramp program. Okay. So uh, over the past couple of years, we've been building up our, our resources so that we can begin to upgrade all of the corners to make sure that all of the ramps are ADA compliant. Uh, so that we're, we're definitely well on our way on getting off the ground on full steam to doing that. Uh, and we're, we're presently following our surfacing uh, operation and wherever we resurface, we are focused on those corners to bring those corners up to ADA compliant. Uh, in regards, you mentioned the snow, uh, you know, there are a number of different resources that are brought to bear during the snowstorm and then after during the cleanup. Uh, and we work with uh, sanitation uh, to distribute resources where they feel they are most focused. And uh, sanitation as well as uh, DOT, we also uh, get people to come on and hire uh, for day work uh, to help us address some areas that we know that we don't normally get to as, as quickly as we normally, as we should. But we, I agree, I hope that we recognize that still there's a lot more work that has to be done. Absolutely. That yes, we have made progress, but still today, you know, especially in many intersections, but I can say especially in disadvantaged community, we still face challenges where Yes, there is sanitation or whoever, men and women, they are hired locally to remove the snow in the morning. Five hours after, snow are back there. I can tell you that even close to where I live in Inwood, I can see how they have been so new work doing the intersection. But whoever has been doing the work they didn't take into consideration, I can tell you, Taylor Street and Broadway, Arden and Broadway, and I, I live in those intersections, when we get water, those water turn ice because there was not the work, the way of how the work were done was not taken into consideration what happened when those intersections get the water and the snow. Right. So, and I, and I do understand that, you know, the, it's a good intention, it's a good plan. I think that it's better than before. And we should not only rely on, well, when the elected official bring those things to our attention, sometimes I'm fed and tired. This is the third hearing that I bring in, and I have to bring it again. I have a big issue on the sidewalk, San Nicolas Avenue between 180 and 181st, and I see people taking notes where we follow up, and I still, just imagine 181st and San Nicolas Avenue, where we have like seven buses that they cross from 181st to the Bronx, and just think about that sidewalk, San Nicolas between 180 and 181st, and, and this is not about work that had to be done in the, in the sidewalk. This is about we, DOT, NYPD, or whoever, no enforcing for pedestrians to have most of the sidewalk for them to walk. This is a business owner right. where he parked the three truck. If you send someone from the 34 and take a photo right now, you will see that person taking most of the sidewalk to have all the merchants in the street, not the three feet, right. because we're good on saying it's probably the 15. And the small business, they're supposed to have three. They probably leave two feet to the, to the pedestrians. And we know what they're doing right right now? They have most of the merchants in the street. Where is the NYPD? Where is the DOT? So I've been, I, since the last hearing, and, and you brought that up, I've been coordinating with the Department of Health and DCA. I know that there have been recent violations have been issued. I think it would be best if offline I connected, because I, it's it's much more than DOT. DCA has a piece, Department of Health has but a what piece. I, what I, what but I, and I'd like to, to, to it's highlight it's for like them two, all. It's like two years. It's like, you know, it's two years. Violations it's, have it's about issued. It's about, you know, Think about, most of you know Washington High, 181st, heavy intersection, hot block. And the person, she has the business, she has most of the merchant in the sidewalk, she take the, right now, right. she's a two truck parked in the street, and she even take the other side on San Nicolas Avenue. The business improvement district, everyone been trying to do something. When are we sending the message to the 8.5 million New Yorkers that we live in the system of law? 
that people should, and especially in my case about it's harder for me because I care for the pedestrians and cyclists. I've been working with you guys citywide. How I go to Brooklyn, Queens, and other places saying that pedestrian and cyclists is my priority when I have two years bringing to your attention. You should not take one more day a week, and I'm not questioning your effort, That's right. but it's about enforcement. There's no enforcement there. But for me, again, like, my concern is about sidewalk. And I want to go back into this, like, you no know, two or three things, and I pass it to my colleague. We have to do better. We have, this administration has, you know, three more years. And I think that this is about, I'm proud to say that I've been working with all of you guys, the agency, making a lot of improvement, Chief Chan, all of you, Margaret, you know, and, and the whole thing of the agency, together with the advocates. We've been reducing crashes. We've been saving lives. But there's intersections continue being places that is now still accessible as they should be for people with disability. Intersection continue being the places where 70% of the crashes happening in the street. Intersection continue being places where drivers are turning in 50 miles per hour. So I just hope that as we're looking on redesigning and we're thinking about you know, having a more aggressive plan, just think about it, that we have few years in this administration. We don't know what is the approach of the new mayor. What about if that person doesn't take into the Vision Zero? So I just would like to invite all of you to you know, work I, together. You know, I, I think you know, that we are kind of bucking the national trend when it comes to traffic deaths. Almost everywhere else it's going up. And the efforts through this council, this administration, this agency, and multiple agencies has seen that good work. The numbers speak to that. I, I can't imagine anyone wouldn't want that work to continue. And we you know, have always worked together uh, to do that. And I, I expect that we'll be doing that the next three years you know, pretty effective. Yeah, but I have an issue. I, I do. I, my issue is that when we try to have a more aggressive plan on establishing a number of, 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 of extensions and re related to the curbside and sidewalk. I think, you know, I think what we could probably build this out number a little bit more holistically from the beginning of the, the Mayor de Blasio administration to now. I know we just talked about 50 in 2017 in terms of curb extensions. Let me build out that information for you a little bit more because I, I think, I, I know we're, if we're not hitting your number in the past, we're exceeding it. I just, we know, I mean, we, you know, we have communities that ask for it. We have communities who, you know, some people don't really want us, you know, coming into their districts and doing these things. So it's a complicated dance in terms of the street improvement projects that we're doing every year. But I think together with you, and, and we love your uh, aggressive approach to this, and we, and we think that works well for us. Okay. Um, so we appreciate that. But l let us build out the numbers since the beginning of the administration, not just 2017. That's fair. OK, That's thank fair. you. In, in my, last, my last concern, not related to the DOT, but well, on, on painting the bus stop in, in, the, in the hard drive, fire drive, it doesn't make sense. Like, I know about people should obey the law. I don't know how many of, when we are not working with you, when we are not, you know, when we are just parking a vehicle, like how many times do you have to be standing in the fire drive and counting your feet to be sure that you have all the measures, like why? If it's not painting, what is the signal? What is, how are we allowing people to know if we pass the 15 feet, you will get a ticket. But how, and this is about revenue. This is not about, this is not about safety, sir. This is not about safety, this is about revenue. Because, let me put it this way. Bus stop, 202, 10th Avenue. I was able to get, be able to work with DOT work with the MTA and get the M100 to go through Broadway and Dagman, go to 10th Avenue so that the senior citizen population will be able to have access to buses. How drivers of anyone know what is the distance that they have to park, not to park a vehicle, 
so that they get a ticket. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I oversee the 3,000 traffic agents throughout the city. They're all trained to utilize the sidewalks as a reference and that each box on the sidewalk represents five feet so that they're told you have to have three boxes and those boxes have to be clear. And anyone parking closer than that is parking closer than 15 feet. I could tell you that our motto in the Traffic Enforcement District is move traffic, reduce collisions, move traffic, protect pedestrians, move traffic, save lives, move traffic, move traffic, move traffic. We take it so seriously that every meeting that we have at my place, we start off with that motto. We've had flyers uh, printed up and they're posted in all our facilities, large posters. Every single locker, every one of my people has a locker sticker with that motto on it. We talk about public safety all the time and the summonses that we focus on we call traffic flow violations. Those are the summonses that more than others increase the likelihood of a collision and obstruct traffic the most. Those would be bus stops, double parkers, parking lots. Okay, but let's, sir, and sir. So when you say hey, revenue, that's that's Listen, not okay, about I, you, you're, giving, you're giving all the data, I agree. I've been a partner with you guys, Chief Chan, all of you, improving safety for pedestrians and cyclists. My concern is, why don't we put a mark, whatever it is, to allow people to know that if you park in this area, you get a ticket. Why? That's not up to us. I'm just letting you know what the current reference is that we utilize and the traffic agents are trained to utilize. Okay, but my, is the arguments about why, the whole concern about no, we should live in, it's like, my, I know about drivers should get ticket. I know when I have my plaque where I cannot park. And I would never do it when I cannot park. Because for me, it's about we need to enforce the law. But here we're saying that it's 15 feet, the distance. When someone knows that that's a 15 feet? So I can't state how people know, but the fact that parking at a hydrant is a violation is universally known. It is also one of the areas that put PD enforces but, very heavily. But let, let me stop you there. In regards let me, to the let, me, let, me, let, me, let me stop you there. Let's double the fine for people who park in front of the fire drive. I'm not talking, I'm not addressing that. We should double the fine. The question is, should people know the distance that they should not be allowed to park? And we have to, look, I have, I get it, we need this revenue. I have a bill, let me put it in this way, I have a bill that will allow drivers to park the vehicle after sanitation park the street. You know what I've been told? If we pass this bill, we reduce the revenue by $38 million. So being fair to everyone, all I'm asking is, bus stop, the one that, the fire drive, no one should be parking in front. Drivers should have a double ticket. All I'm saying is about, how drivers know when they should not be allowed, where they should not be allowed to park. It is our responsibility as government to, do, to be fair to everyone. How 10th Avenue 201, we put a bus stop, and there's now any mark that mark the distance with a sign saying from here, there, this is a bus stop. So, Come on. So we, we do put signs at all of our bus stops. If there's a sign missing and we are aware of it, we will come and replace them. No, you have a sign that's saying this is the bus stop in this direction. That direction can go two blocks. You don't have the sign where, where that distance finished. Unless a sign is missing, we, we will have where the bus stop begins and where the bus stop Oh, is. let me put it in my community. In so my community, it looked that they've been missing most of the sign. I can take you right now. I can take you to Broadway and Taylor Street, and someone can go look and look at it right now. Someone can go to 10th Avenue or 202, and that sign has not been put in there. So I want to leave it there because the, for me, I think that it brings us to, do we need to put sensor? How do we measure? How does DOT know how many signs are missing? It's all about being fair to everyone. I, I just want to say if the, the bus sign has a directional arrow, that, that means it goes to the end of the block. The bus, that's so you're not supposed to park 
to the end of the block. I, I did want to just clarify. Okay. okay and, I, and I, I, under I, 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 I understand. And again, I understand where you're coming from. Taylor Street, Broadway. You can go there. The Taylor Street is there. It is fair because from the bus stop in that direction to the Taylor Street, there's only probably like. You said 10th and Broadway? 10th Avenue and 202 Ten Avenue. and Broadway. And, but I think that my colleague can talk about different places. This is, about, this is not about my community. This is about, again, and I'm for pedestrian and cyclists. Let's be clear. I'm not here for promoting, making the life better for car owners. I'm not about making life fair to everyone. So with that, I want to now give the opportunity to my colleague that has question. Uh, but I hope again that when, when you look to the arguments about we should not paint it, why? Because it would cost $7 million. I, How many revenue do we collect with I, those tickets? By, because, because consumers, they don't know because we are not giving them the information we, on the distance that they should not be allowed. Also, let's paint it, let's increase the penalty. We also think that it opens up uh, maybe um, some ingenious New Yorkers to go down to Hobie Depot and buy a can of paint and maybe paint their own curb. We do think that opens it up a little bit, that you know, you, we would have people painting curbs that because they see that curbs are paint, you know, that the city's going around and painting curbs around hydrants and, and bus stops, that they would paint their own curbs, which is something that we go out and, and send inspectors for now. So I, I completely understand the sentiment in which you're coming from. Right. We already have a defacement of curb problem as well. The over 3,000 complaints come in of people deciding to paint their own curbs, and we have to go out. I, I feel that as we are talking about technology and then this conversation about, you know, technology in the city, and I'm for the city be more pro-technology, I think that there's a lot of information on sensors, there's more information on apps, there's all the information that, all the way mechanisms that we should put in place. This is all about being advocate for the consumers, for people that they should know what it that they're getting into. If I cross this line, I get a ticket. But how are we putting that information to individuals? That's my concern on it doesn't have to be painted. It's about any signal, but it's about being fair and transparency on those information. How does New Yorkers know on the condition of the bridges? You say that this is a public information, like people go online and they can find out right now the grading of the bridges? Yeah, we, we actually produce uh, an annual report. But my question is, how does the 8.5 million New Yorkers as you say, the report is there, but sometimes we need to be foiled. Sometimes the report is put in now. How, and for, for us, it's about the 8.5 million it's, New Yorkers it's our, knowing the It's conditions. on our website. Our, our Bridges report is on our website. It's a public document. It's easy for New Yorkers to yeah. get into yeah. one area, they yep. go there and they get it. Yep. Which is the worst bridge that we have right now? On based on the grading, you're doing the assessment. Okay, oh. I'm, I'm not the bridge person, but we can get back to you and let you we, know. We can, okay. we can get you, yeah. Thank you. I generally don't like to do it in terms of the <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I found uh, that it's helpful to frame this debate a little bit. So before I start with my questions, this council has been in session for 11 months, short three days. Have either or any of your agencies ever come before this council and said, uh, hello, council members, this bill that you're proposing is genius. We love it and we look forward to its imminent passage. I can't recall every time we've that we've testified. Do you recall ever having back. come before this council and have, saying? I know that I'm, there was the one you were just listening. Other than the other than the speed camera bill, uh, do you recall any time where you came before this council and said this was a good idea? We look forward to this bill passing immediately. Five days. Right, you you think Five about it. Away. We'll go to police department. Police department. Any time that you ever thought that a bill that came out of this council was a good idea should happen immediately, and you came here and supported it. Sure. I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind was the revenge porn legislation we testified in favor of. Excellent. Yeah. The answer is yes. Not in those exact words, but we have come before this council in support of legislation that it's introduced. That, you, that as it was written, you were supportive? There might have been some drafting changes that were required, but substantially, My question yes. is, did you ever come before this council in a first hearing and say the bill as drafted is perfect? We look forward to it being passed. I'd have to take a look to double okay, check. Okay. So you can't recall yes. No agency can recall okay. yes. So there we go. 955 by Councilmember Gorodnik that raised the caps on construction fines. 
the car share pilot that was introduced by Councilmember Levine. A revenue bill. Got it. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure we framed that properly. We had this conversation the, the car last share time. The pilot's not a revenue bill. It's a fine bill. No, no it's the, the car share pilot in terms of. You said it increases fines? No, the, there's 955 that was introduced by Councilmember Gorodnik. That increases fines for uh, construction sites. And then the next bill was uh, the car share pilot introduced by Councilmember Levine. Too. Okay, and you were perfect with it the way it was. Yeah. It's good to know. Okay, no, and we I had just, this conversation uh, the last time you were in front of the council, and yes, I remember. Okay, perfect. Yes. Another one came yes, to sir. mind was Councilmember Deutsch's bill about getting accident reports online. We testified in favor of that bill. As it was written, you liked yeah, it the way I, it was. Excellent. Yes. Very good. Okay, there are ten bills in front of this committee today, and one resolution. Any of your agencies support any of them? As written? For the bills that affect the buildings department, the answer is no. Okay. Police? As written, no. All right. Transportation? Kind of know written, that answer. No. no. All right. But I think we express a willingness to want to work with the sponsors of the legislation. Sure. So I just want to make that clear. Excellent. Um, police department, you've indicated that your traffic enforcement agents do not have the ability to determine which curb cuts have been created legally versus those that result from illegal actions. Uh, what kind of equipment do your traffic enforcement agents carry, department issued? Well, the, the traffic agents, uh, what do you call it, the handheld device? devices? Yeah, the handheld devices that, Wireless, they right? to, that they use to scan They can scan a registration, search into the database, pull up the information about the plate registra registration, print it out on a summons. They also have a wireless printer attached to their hip, correct? Several pieces of equipment. The City of New York, on the Department of Buildings, you're right there, you can tell me if I'm lying, but it's in our committee report. The Department of Buildings has a buildings information system and can search for properties by the house number to determine if a curb cut permit was obtained. It's on your, on your, in your systems. That is correct. I can sit at my desktop, take a look, you know, one center street, is there a curb cut, and it'll tell me. That's correct. Is there a reason that your traffic enforcement agents can't do that? from their wireless well, the, machines? The wireless machines, a couple, a couple of issues, right? So the fact that a permit may have been issued to a particular residence, for example, let's say they have a legal curb cut. Let's say they made a second curb cut, which is illegal. Let's say that an individual complained about the illegal curb cut and a violation was issued by DOB. That would register in whatever the database is that you're mentioning. I'm not familiar with it, that there is a legal curb cut there. How is an agent or a police officer, for that matter, going to distinguish between the two separate curb cuts? The other issue is that you mentioned uh, the device used by the traffic agents. It's a device with a limited purpose. Now, its ability to enter in and do Google searches or whatever types of searches would require to go into the DOB database to figure that piece out, they're incapable of doing. Whether we're able to upgrade those particular devices to do that or we would have to actually expend monies to create new devices that were able to do that, and that's assuming that we figured out the first issue, which is being able to distinguish what is legal versus what is illegal. Okay. I mean, that's something that needs You're, to be looked into. The, the, uh, the database that I'm referring to is uh, on NYC.gov. It belongs to the city of New York, I believe, right? You're referring to Biz, I presume. You're referring to Biz. Yes. Okay, so that's a city database. I assume, I'm, I'm not a tech guy, but I assume that the machinery that can wirelessly link into searching a plate and coming back with the information about the registrant can similarly be retrofitted somehow without expending an enormous amount of money so that it can simply go into the Department of Buildings tools. Uh, your testimony is the department would be incapable of complying with intro 939 as written, incapable. It, that basically says your hands are tied, there is nothing you can do to make this work. As, as the bill is written today with the technology that we utilize right now, that is true. 
More, well, to the, more to your point, Council Member, if I may, the information sure. that's contained in biz, while there, some of that information is there, is not entirely comprehensive. Ah. To the extent that that curb cut permit was issued recently, um, that would be included there. But for many of our older buildings, prior to the existence of a certificate of occupancy in 1938, information on curb cut permits and the like may not be in contained in biz. Great. When a, when a traffic enforcement agent or, uh, agent or a police officer issues a summons, they affirm under the penalty of perjury that they personally observe the violation they're in charge. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Are you comfortable with your, having your agents and police officers affirm under the penalty of perjury a guess that it is a violation when they're writing a summons for something that is not actually a violation on the guess? I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that characterization. Okay, how would you characterize that, it? I don't believe that they're guessing. I believe what's happening is they're making a good faith uh, determination based on the existence. Well, of let's the explore problem. that a little bit, sir. When somebody parks in front of his own driveway, he has, as stated in the traffic rules, the right to do so, right? So if a traffic agent comes upon that car and sees it parked in front of a driveway and then writes a summons, he's guessing that that person had no right to park there. That's, that's not, not a guess. That's, okay, what is it? Well, that's just not the accurate state of affairs of okay. what's happening. Tell me. So based on the ad code, what we would, the, so let's take a step back. Summons is issued for blocking a driveway or complaint-driven summonses, right? So we would need a complainant, which would be the building owner or the premises owner, would be calling and saying, I have a vehicle blocking my driveway. That individual is what's bringing us there. An agent is not Can you walking. pause for one second while I just, on that point, and then you can continue? You do not require as a matter of policy that the complainant be present and state his or her name for the issuing officer to write on the summons or keep a record complaint given by Mrs. Jones at such and such address. You don't require that. And how do I know that? I know that because I have a constituent that received two summonses in the last month for parking in, in front of his own driveway, presumably because a neighbor didn't like him and call, made a call. I don't have a driveway, it wasn't me. But it, it, it was, it, it is not necessary, it is complaint driven, I agree with that. I don't believe that your traffic enforcement agents are going around looking for driveways. I, I do give you that and I'm not accusing the department of doing otherwise. But it is complaint driven in the sense that you respond to a complaint, but it's also not required that the complainant be listed or identified in any way. So there's no verification that the complainant is actually the person whose house is having the driveway blocked. So the purpose of this bill is to require that the department um, verify in some way before issuing a summons that they're not guessing that the person who's parked there is unlawfully doing so. So, council member, I mean, in the same testimony that, that you're referring to, I'm saying that this is a valid issue, and I offer to work with council member Holden, who's the sponsor of the bill, on figuring out a solution to that. Now, having traffic agents or police er officers doing property record searches at a driveway is not the solution to this issue. Now, we can work together and figure out What's what the, the right... What do you suppose well, would, this, would be the solution? I think that's something that we This can bill was introduced months ago. You're here today. You don't have a proposed solution, what you think might... I mean, you came here to say that you want to work with Councilman Holden to come up with a good solution. Right. This bill was introduced several months ago. Have you come up with a good solution to offer up to Councilman Holden? I mean, certainly there are processes and there's penalties in place to... Uh, that have curb, cut, curb cuts examined and building owners fined for having illegal curb cuts. Uh, part of that penalty, and uh, I mean, DOB can correct me if I'm wrong, would be the requirement that there's a restoration of the curb by the We're property We're gonna get owner. to that in a minute, but I'm talking about the violation on the car that's parked there, and this bill would require that before that car get a ticket, it's an expensive ticket, that the issuing officer be certain that he that he or she is affirming under the penalty of perjury and not committing perjury. Well, I don't I don't believe that an officer and traffic agent are committing perjury by issuing a summons for an existing curb cut. If they the legal, if they the don't legal, know that it's a viol that, legal, that parking there is itself a violation, they have to have reasonable suspicion. They do that, have reasonable suspicion there's a curb cut there. And what's the probable cause to issue the summons? The existence of a curb cut. 
So without having verified that the curb cut is lawful, they are able to have probable cause that the curb cut is lawful and that the person there in park is committing a violation of the code. The existence of the curb cut is what gives them probable cause to So it sounds to me like you need this bill to help you. Again, as I've okay. stated in my testimony, we are more than happy to work with the council member on figuring out the right solution. All right, but yeah, but uh, but uh, but as I said, I you haven't you haven't come here in several months of, of the bill being introduced with a solution ready to say, hey, you know, council, we'll you guys think you're so smart, council, but we have a better solution. Here it is. We'll sit down with the member and figure something out. Okay. Um, the Department of Buildings. The bill would require the department to conduct an inspection before issuing a permit for a curb cut. You don't like that? Uh, not supportive of that, no. Okay. I know why, because I read it. You call it as of right. As of right is a term of art, and I agree it's as of right in some cases when, when, um, uh, when an application is being submitted and a permit is being granted, but it's not really, really as of right in the sense that they have to ask for permission. They can't just go cut it. I have as of right to pick up this pen and put it in my pocket because I brought it here. And, you know, counsel to the committee is not going to say you just stole my pen. So that's my as of right. But as of right, when it comes to cutting a curb, it's not really as of right because they have to go to you for permission. Wouldn't it be prudent to require that the department take a look before issuing a permit? So it is as of right in the sense that when the application is filed with the department and assuming that application and what's requested, in this case a curb cut, complies with co the building code and the zoning resolution, the department is obligated, is required to issue that permit. Now, like the police department had mentioned, we're not here to not acknowledge that a problem exists here. There certainly is a problem. And we look forward to working with you and the council to try and find remedies to do that. As it relates to legal curb cuts, the problem that we have today isn't for those jobs that go through the department's process and our scrutiny. It relates to work that's performed without a permit. So when someone's submitting an application to the department seeking to install a curb cut, they go through the motions and they either get their approval or they get their disapproval. When we go out to perform inspections as it relates to complaints related to legal curb cuts, understanding that the vast majority of them don't result in the issuance of a violation, when violations are in fact issues, issued, it's for installing the curb cut without a permit. It's for installing that curb cut without department scrutiny, without submitting an application for approval, without securing a permit. So to require an inspection prior to the issuance of a permit for a curb cut application, we feel doesn't really get at the heart of the problem. Well, because the, the heart of the problem is the work that's being performed the, without a permit. The purpose and intent and th the manner in which 953 was written is to address the situation of illegal curb cuts that are already there, and this is in effect a method to permit a legalization, if you will, of some of these, which is, is arguable whether or not that's a good idea, but it's my bill, so I guess I have to take ownership of it. Um, but the point of that is for the department to know what is actually there before this legalization process of an unlawful curb cut be, be uh, 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 thought about. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to ask community boards to opine and to give community boards 60 days in, within which to do so. You don't like that either. We, I mean, in terms of providing a 60-day window for community boards to provide input, recommendations, thought. In terms of providing notification to community boards, there's clearly no harm in that. We routinely react with them, interact with them. This information is all available publicly. Wait, but. The, the but, concern, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna, sir, I, I don't mean to be flipped, but nobody needs notification. The community boards don't need notification that the, that the big behemoth city of New York is about to descend upon them and throw something bad in their neighborhood. That doesn't help them. Now they know something bad is going to happen in the neighborhood. Congratulations. The reason that we, w that we do things like community board notification is so that there could be a legitimate interaction between the community board, which is the closest to the ground level of government, the one, frankly, that the constituents beat up more than, more than your agency, and, and the people. So notifying the community board that uh, you know 17 curb cuts were just uh, approved by your department and they're going to be installed probably within the next couple of weeks, be on the lookout isn't really the purpose of, that we're trying to achieve here. What we're trying to achieve is that the community board can say, hey, don't approve this curb cut. The guy cut it illegally. He shouldn't have it. He should repair it and
frankly, the number of curb cuts on a particular block are such that you can't even park at a curb anymore because they're every three feet. You can't fit cars in between some of those curb cuts. And that's the problem that this is not a bill that, that I invented. This is a bill that has a predecessor in the last council. It was actually first introduced, um, I believe, by council member uh, Vincent Vin Gentili uh, four years ago. So it, it has a longevity, and I'm hopeful that, you know, during the last four years, your agency would have been able to come here with some kind of a plan of we recognize the problem and your bill is dumb, but here's a better way to do it. So I understand, Council Member, the intent of the legislation and the sort of checks that you referenced that a community board or someone from the community might ask the department to do. We're doing those checks now. So we're, we're making sure prior to issuance of a permit that the request for the installation of a curb cut complies with code and zoning. If it complies with but you're not zoning, looking to see if it's already there. You're not doing a visual inspection. You don't want to. If it's a legalization job, if it's a legalization work, an inspection is going to need to be performed after the fact. After it's the work is done, but what we're suggesting is that somebody is coming and with an application saying, "Wow, this 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 law was just passed, and these crazy council members want to do this thing, and if I don't get this done, I'm going to get fined. So I better put in this application." Don't you want to come and check? to see that these are bad actors. Don't you want to come and check and see what they're doing? I don't exactly understand what you mean by bad actors, but again- They, have, they have a curb cut without, a, without authorization. They're coming for a legalization of something that exists Correct. without permission. In order to legalize that curb cut, meaning that it's a curb cut that can lawfully exist under code and zoning, absent the fact that they failed to secure a permit, they're seeking legalization in the department to correct that condition, they need the permit. Once again, that job will go through scrutiny, code and zoning a violation like every other job does. We'll make sure where it is in relation to other curb cuts on the block. We'll get okay. taken, you know, where it is where it stops um, to hydrants and bus stops. This is an analysis that's already being performed. What if this is course. a discretionary curb cut in the sense that it's not something that, that uh, is, is typical for a, build, for a project or a building in that particular zoning, but the owner is applying for one and would like the department to approve it. And in that case, we have the same process where the, where the uh, department uh, would give notification to the community board. The community board would have 60 days within which to respond. Would you support that? Our approvals aren't discretionary. They're based on an analysis of code and zoning. And if code and zoning reveals it's permissible, we're obligated to issue the permit. Okay, so the issue is that, that so, so you're offering a solution to the bill, which is that we should change it and say that you're, that you shouldn't have the authority to issue curb cuts anymore. No, if, I'm, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. If, if, the, if the application to install a curb cut meets the requirements of code and zoning, the department is obligated to issue that permit. If it does not, we will deny the application and not issue a permit. Okay. DOT. While, while I'm looking for my notes on this, uh, DOT, you issue permits also, right? Uh, we do. Okay. Um, yes, we, we issue construction permits, yes. You, you issue, you issue uh, permits for storage of equipment on streets from time to time? Yes, we do. You issued a permit for the storage of a diesel generator in my district directly across the street from a school uh, that's been there for several weeks, spewing fumes into the school building, poisoning children in my neighborhood, we have attempted through your borough office to address that. They have sent out a team. Uh, one, apparently a violation was issued and then subsequent thereto, uh, another member of your staff said, well actually that violation may not have been properly issued because the permit allows for the uh, generator to be stored there. So my question is, what is the name of the person who issues permits of this nature? Uh, and whether or not a, uh, it's two questions in one, and whether or not a visual inspection of the site is done prior to uh, authorizing the installation and the storage of a diesel spewing generator on a residential street. And we have an, an, an entire division that's issuing permits. I, I don't, there's several, several people that work. Several there, so people? I, don't have it. I mean, I don't even know if it's hundreds that work in the permitting division, but it's a lot. Are we able to track person, one particular so permit to a name? Are you, do you have the technology that allows you to do that? Are you able to go backwards? I don't know if I need technology for that, if I can, if I can make a phone call okay. for that. 
I am aware of this issue. Just so you know, I've been looking at emails all children today, are in knowing the that children are in school under today under and, and, and yesterday. And, and, and I knew before. that I was going to see you today that, and it was likely that you were going to bring it, bring it up. So it's you know at my so level, well. which is, um, I'm sorry? You know me so well. Well, we're learning. Um, so I, it's at my level now, which I Thank know you. isn't the highest level at the agency, but I'm- It's as high as I'm going to get. I don't agree with that, but um, you, you never know. But uh, I'm pushing to try and get you an answer, the answers that you're seeking as quickly as possible. We just want it removed. And, and yeah, that's and what I, we I said. I can't tell you four that times, that's something that can happen right now. Four times DOT said that they're, that they're gonna send out an inspector, an inspector. And we just want it removed because every single minute of the day, 24 hours a day, it's spewing fumes into the air, and we have a school that, that houses children for right. approximately 12 of those hours every single day, including, by the way, when everybody was you know, having Thanksgiving dinner, schools open in my neighborhood on Thanksgiving, right. schools open on, on Sundays, the, the children are there, right. and they're breathing in these fumes every single day, and it's been going on for weeks. So let me I see what the talk best offline. I can do it's with not you the by the end of today, but I, I, I don't I, want to take up. I don't want to take Definitely, the chair. Definitely, it's in my inbox. I don't want to take the chair's time on this. I, thank you, I thank you, Council that. Member. Um, you, you testified, Chair, and I'm going to wrap up real quick. Uh, I know that there are other members uh, who wish to inquire. You testified that um, that DOT understands the unauthorized curb cuts issue. I'm not going to read back the whole thing, but I'm going to read the part that I underlined. It would likely require a significant new contract and resources for DOT and should be weighed against all the competing needs of the agency to enhance safety and mobility and maintain our street infrastructure and good repair. And a little bit of what I just read um, and the frustration I'm about to uh, uh, display is uh, relates to my chair's um, frustration, I think, in that, you know, DOT is a big agency. It's one of the largest ones, right, in the city. You know, there's the, there's the top several and DOT's up there. And, you know, there, there are things that we ask for like, a curb, uh, uh, um, uh, a speed hump in the middle of the street. And it takes us like a year and a half to get it. I'm still getting answers from my predecessor's request. I call him up when I get an answer that he was denied for a speed hump that he asked for, you know, in 2017. And, you know, he's as happy as I am, unfortunately. Um, and you, you're, you're, you tell the council that you require this significant new contract and resources for DOT, and this relates to repairing the illegal curb cuts. But tell us how much. Tell us what the issue is. Let us know what is it that you would need to make this work? What is it that you would need to make chair's requests work? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the budget is supposed to be a negotiated project between the mayor and the legislator, uh, legislative branch. And the, your budget comes to this council done on your side of City Hall. It's the, the, the chairman, chair of the Transportation Committee doesn't write up the budget for the Transportation Department. You write up the budget. So what do you need? So from, from our point of view, in terms of uh, repairing illegal curbs, one of the things, as you know, we have a very robust sidewalk violation program. And, and we go from community board to community board, and sometimes it takes anywhere between three to five years to get back to another community board. Now if we could somehow get a list of all these illegal curbs and include them into our sidewalk program, we would be able to incorporate it in that program and do it while we're going through community boards uh, dealing with sidewalk defects. But what, so we're suggesting, concern, what we're suggesting though is since you do this work and you do descend on neighborhoods and walk up and down the streets and mark off the, the uh, uh, the, flags the flags that need to be sidewalk. repaired, you, you're right there. I'm not saying you could hit every neighborhood on the day after this bill is enacted, but I'm saying that during the course of your work, look at the curb. And if the curb cut's cut, if there's a curb cut, access Mr. Building's department's wonderful database and check it out and see what happens. Or take a note and look at it later. I'm saying I think our come up with some kind of... Yeah, so, so our bigger concern is your time frame. Is we don't think we could do that within six months, considering we cycle through the entire city, community by community board by community board, over a, a you know a several year cycle. So one thing, that, and this, so that's one thing we're saying that we'd want to work with the council on and directly with you is in terms of that time frame. Does it mean so if we get you know there's we're working in community boards 17 and 18, right? But we would the goal would be, and we would have to work together, and all this isn't fleshed out and it's not final. 
or even near final, but how we could include restoring those illegal curb cuts within the sidewalk work that we're already okay. doing. I, I want to yield. What we think uh, is the, the path forward here, but it's your six month time frame that we don't think is tenable. I want, I want to yield this back to the chair because there are other members who want to talk, and I'm hopeful that in a round two we can pick up exactly where we left off. Mr. Chair, thank you very much for indulging me. Councilmember Holder. Hi, got it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilman uh, Yeager for uh, asking a lot of questions um, and getting some uh, strange responses. Um, but uh, I'm glad you argued this, uh, uh, Councilman Yeager. Uh, it's a very, very important subject in, in my community, in most communities, these illegal curb cuts. And we're, we're trying to address a, a problem that's you know, as we know, as you all know, that parking is, a is at a premium in certain neighborhoods, and people are desperate, homeowners are desperate. So they're cutting illegal curb cuts. Some of them are obvious to see that they're illegal because they have two, sometimes more. Sometimes they park in front of their door, blocking their door. They've gotten so desperate. Yet it's a building department complaint. Try to get the building department to, to come out when somebody's parked in front of the door and on a nightly basis. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, but the illegal curb cuts that we're seeing sometimes are very obvious. So we're asking that the police department have another layer of just checking to see if a curb cut is illegal before they issue a summons. Because once they issue an illegal summons or a summons that's wrong, then the person who's innocent has to go through, jump through hoops to try to prove that this curb cut was illegal. And I've had that, I've had people complaining in my neighborhoods. So we're trying to address a problem that exists in the city of New York. What we need is cooperation from both the police department and the billing department, Department of Buildings. We need cooperation, we need a solution. And not just we can't do it. We need something, some, some feedback from you, from you guys to say, okay, um, we could try this. We could try that. We're not hearing that. We're hearing we're just against these, these, uh, these bills. Um, some of the curb cuts are quite obvious that they're illegal. Like somebody puts a board at the, uh, at the curb, and that's, how, that's what they're using. And, and sometimes they just put asphalt uh, in, in the street to the curb. Sometimes there is no curb. We have many neighborhoods that have no sidewalks or curbs in Queens County, in my district, which I've complained about. This is the 21st century. Why can't we have sidewalks and curbs in, uh, on all streets? But what, we, what we're seeing today is desperation by homeowners that will try anything. And, and again, it's the agencies that are not really cooperating with you know, residents in the neighborhood. So we have the technology. Everybody carries it with them to check. Asking a police officer before they issue a, an expensive summons to just check that this is legal. And when in doubt, by the way, you, you said that uh, um, sometimes there are two curb cuts and there's some doubt. Well, at least you have another layer. If they make a mistake, they make a mistake. But they, at least there's another layer to check. Oh, there's only one curb cut that's approved here. Uh, which one is it? Um, but we got a, it's complaint driven. We got a complaint. Let's act on the complaint. And you can issue a summons. If you're wrong, that would be fought. But certainly, issuing a summons to an illegal, you know, somebody's parked in an illegal curb cut um, is wrong. It's definitely wrong. So all we're asking is a, a system to check and come up with one. And we came up with an idea. A bunch of us came up with ideas on the, to deal with the curb cuts. So we need some cooperation from the agencies. So I'd like to see, I, like, I still haven't heard why we can't issue, uh, have somebody check, an officer check, take two minutes, three minutes to check to see if a curb cut is legal or not. Thank you. Councilman Cabrera has any questions? No? So, yeah, so I would like to acknowledge that Council Member Rose was here uh, if my colleague has another question, uh, only three minutes. <laughs> Perfect. I want to. I want to just go back to the police for a second and to uh, uh, continue on Councilman Holden's line, um, Chief. I assume from time to time in your 
the previous part of your career, you've pulled people over for driving. Yes. Okay, and when they give you a license, uh, you look at the license, it looks like it's okay, but you don't write the summons right away. You take the license back to the car, you run the license to make sure it's still valid, because I could have a driver's license, but the guys at the computer typed in that it's revoked, and then I'd be driving without a license. Why do you not believe that that's something we can ask our TEA agents to do, uh, a similar check, if you will, on a property by simply punching in an address? And even if it takes a little work to get the tech, you know, between buildings and, and police to, you know, with an app or something, I mean, p kids today, they're building apps every single day. Apps have been built while I'm sitting here talking to you that were started this morning. There's no reason that the city of New York with an agency like Do It, working together with your tech department, which is renowned, and with buildings, maybe less so, but together, perhaps the geniuses would figure this out. Why can't that be done? Yeah, yeah council member, um, I hope I didn't leave you with the impression that I said it can't be done, right? And I'm just, I was speaking clearly to what the current capability is, and if this bill were to pass tomorrow as drafted, we are incapable of complying How with long it. would it take you to? I, I, okay, I mean, I, look, just like you said. I'm not going to lawyer the die. I realize right. you wrote the word incapable. I understand your intent is not that you're forever permanently incapable, but that I mean, we landed a rover on Mars yesterday. I think Got we're it. capable of doing a How lot of things. How long would it take you? I'm sorry? What, you, sometimes we write in a bill, this, this law will take effect in 180 days after enactment, 90 days after enactment, 30 days. I think, what do you I, need? Well, I, th I think it's, there are, there are a few different parts to this, right? So first, we're not the keepers of the curb cut data, so we would have to work with the DOB. Secondly, uh, to make sure that there would be some sort of a database that would be easy enough for a traffic agent or a police officer to simply hit a button the way they scan a registration barcode and have the answer pop up and have it be a reliable answer. Secondly, we would have to ensure that the technology that we use, the equipment we're currently using, is actually capable of accessing this database so were it to be built. I'm on a clock and, and you're not, so let me, let me do it a different way. How long do you need to, to have in order to come back to Councilman Holden and tell him how long you need to know how long it can take you to build an app. How about that? Like, do you need a week to talk to buildings and figure out how quickly you, then you can come back well, and I say, think, well, it'll take us a year to build I, it. I think, I think the right way to look at it is that, and what I said in my testimony is I'm more than happy and I'm looking forward to working with Council Member Holden on figuring out what the right solution is. Maybe this is the right solution where we build a database and upgrade technology that could access it. Maybe that's the solution. Maybe we can work together and figure out a solution that's less complicated to do, that's less costly to do, that can get the same result. So that's the point that I'm trying to make. I just, I think just point out to you that right now parking violations can't dismiss a summons in the interest of justice. They have to have, the, they have, to have sufficient facts uh, demonstrated by the respondent to, to, uh, to combat the evidence, the, 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 I guess the, uh, uh, the, the prima facie evidence that on the summons because obviously the ticket writer's not there. So if somebody gets a summons for this, the likelihood that they can get it dismissed, maybe it's 50-50, maybe it's 80-20, but it's not 100%. And, and that's, that's where I think some of this frustration comes, where you're seeing these, and I'll wrap up, Mr. Chairman, thank you, it'll be my last comment, and it's not a question, but you're seeing these, these uh, driveways that you know intuitively, because we're New Yorkers all our lives, you could, I could smell an illegal driveway from a legal driveway. You see it, you know it, you see the other houses, you see that it's a carport, it's not a driveway, it's, a lawn used to be there, come on, we all know that. And then the guy's parked in front of it, and then he gets a summons, and then it, the burden's on him. It's a burden shifter. And you don't get those summonses dismissed to 100% certainty. Maybe it's a success rate of 80%, but I know that in my office right now, we had a case where a constituent has uh, two summonses, he lives in the premises, he does not have a single piece of ID that says that he lives in the premises, so he can't even walk into uh, parking violations court uh, oath DOF, whatever they call it, with his driver's license, he has to have 
Um, his driver's license says another place because he doesn't live, didn't live there until three months ago. He has to walk in with a lease and a whole bunch of other stuff and then roll the dice that the judge agrees with him. That's where this is coming from. And, and so and I need, you know, no councilman Holden wants to get this bill done, but really, you know, some of this frustration that I started with at the beginning of my line of inquiry in the first round is that, you know, the agencies come here and, you know, this is a bad bill, and then give us something more to work with. Well, again, I, I didn't say this is a bad bill. What I said no, was I know. this You're is work a, with I, I said that no, uh, beyond the work, be beyond working together, I said that this is a real issue. Okay. And I'm not denying that this I really is do an thank issue you. that and needs I, a solution. I hope my tone doesn't indicate a lack of respect for the work that you do. Um, I really do. It's just that, you know, some of the, some of the, especially I guess maybe in three years, I'll be a little more jaded. Uh, but in the first, uh, in the first year of our time together, uh, and Councilman Holden and I have had many, many conversations about some of these middle class frustrations in some of the neighborhoods we represent and uh, really do need to try to do something to ease the burden on people. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilman Guerrero, how? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I apologize, uh, I get here late, but I was chairing another hearing uh, with Council Member Danique Mueller and we just finished over there. Uh, and this question goes more to the Department of Buildings uh, we have a gas station uh, that had, you know, an entrance, the curb, an entrance, and then an exit, and they took it upon themselves to literally take the entire side, both sides, and made it all an exit. Cars were coming. They were accustomed to parking there. We have a lot of parking problems that are multiplying literally, I'm not exaggerating, every year we have more of a more par parking problems. So they were getting tickets, they had to go and you know, try to get them dismissed. Some were dismissed, some were not. Uh, and be honest with you, I, I don't blame uh, the police department because it looked like it's an exit, right? But there's a sign that in the top, it says you could park here during the certain hours and uh, to this day, I haven't seen the uh, Department uh, Building Steel summon them. I'll tell you exactly where it's at. It's in Tremont and uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's the only gas station there. We have very few uh, in the area. Uh, if you guys could attend to that because uh, is sending mixed it's very confusing. Uh, very, and it's illegal what the gas station did. You know, they created their own, there was no permits. We know that for a fact. We did the full investigation. It was, it was all over the news. Uh, so if you guys could follow up with that and, and get back to me, and, and they're the ones who deserve a ticket uh, for doing that. So my people, my community, uh, you know, they totally ignore you guys, like you didn't matter. Uh, and, and they're not considering our constituents in the district. And so my, I guess my next logical, my, my first logical question would be, what would you do in that case? So first, uh, thank you for bringing it to my attention. I personally am not familiar with it, but we'll look at it right away and get back to you next week, okay. uh, this week rather. Okay. Um, in terms of our response, we'll go out there and perform an inspection to see what exists. We'll also refer to building code and the zoning resolution to understand what is permissible at that specific area. We'll see if there are any permits proposed to do any work related to curb cuts. And all of that activity will inform what, if any, violations we issue. Certainly it's possible there could be violations issued for work without a permit, for installation of curb cuts without a permit from the department. There could be violations issued for violations of the zoning resolution, placing a curb cut in a, in a zoning district where a curb cut is not permissible. So depending on what we see and observe, both at the location and through our research of records, to the extent that we have them, we'll be able to issue violations and take appropriate action. But can you force them? Can you force them to uh, create the curb like it was before. Because they all say, oh, I'll pay the 500 bucks, whatever it is, I think it's $500, and they just ignore you. So the, the penalties associated with violations are generally more than that. When we issue a violation, correction of that violation requires restoration of the curb, of the curb cut. Um, if they fail to do so upon reinspection, if the curb cut has not been restored, we issue additional violations with what we call aggravated or higher penalty amounts. Is the, what class of violation would this be considered? 
Well, um, they can escalate as high as a class one violation. Okay. Okay, looking forward to working with you. We have sent information to whoever was handling that, but I'm glad I brought it up to you. I'm glad you're going to be able to follow. Thank Appreciate you. it. It means a lot. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, thank you so much. So with that, I think that overall we agree that important progress has been made. We've been working together. You know, the Boulevard Avenue and all the places we've been there in many events. You know, celebrating that for the first time there's a reduction of death of great New Yorkers. But as we know, it's not about personal, it's about we as a legislative bodies and agencies sometimes, you know, we don't like to be told what to do. And, you know, it's better to have all the flexibility. I feel that we have to be more aggressive to continue being a strong advocate for pedestrians, you know, and working with transportation alternative, family for safe street, and all of you as a guy in the city, you know, there's like close to 900,000 New Yorkers with disability. Tomorrow we can join the family. And when we look at intersections, no doubt that we have to continue making those particular area where most New Yorkers come together to cross the street. It's not in the middle of the block are is in those intersections. So whatever we can do and new policy that we can put in place to work with specific numbers. And I know that we've been working together with some goal, but I feel that now it's time for us to look at how are we doing with those goals. And I'm not saying that we're not going moving in the right direction, but it's more, can we be more aggressive? Can we identify a larger number of sidewalk that we should be, you know, enhancing and working with extension uh, to identify those intersections where extension may be implemented to enhance. When it comes to knowing which sidewalk for which DOT is responsible also to uh, be moving the snow, making repairs, I think that those that are, are important. And at the moment, this is not about, I'm not questioning if the agency doesn't know where those locations are. It's about providing the 8.5 million New Yorkers and, and the visitors those open data information to them so that they can have access. People expect that agency are more accountable, that agency are more transparent. And I think that with these numbers of bills, and you heard from my colleagues, I can talk about those that I have introduced and I'm happy to hear that we can continue having this conversation. But you know, this coming Thursday, we're gonna be holding a hearing about how we respond to the snow, that six inches. And there's a lot that we will be discussing this coming Thursday in our hearing at 1, 1 p.m. together with a joint hearing, the Committee of Sanitation and Education but we have to learn from any things that happen in our city. I think that as we, will, as we will be addressing, you know, what happened on Thursday, I want for us to be thinking about the 900,000 New Yorkers with disability. How do they navigate to cross when they get into the intersections? What is the plan that we have to remove the snow? Because for me, I don't want to be as a council member who call and we have agencies are very accessible to us. And say, here, guy, this intersection has not been clean. Do we have sensor? How do we measure? How are we putting this place in, this system in place? As I said before, I see great work being done on making the intersection more accessible in my own area, Taylor and Adrian Street. But I also saw that when we had some raining and what a cold weather, uh, weather that, water, that water turned into ice. So people with disability, they are not able to cross in that intersections. So I think that again, we always will be open to identify challenges and how to make things better. But again, today's hearing is about, it was about holding, you know, agency more accountable and hear from the agency on how we can be more pro pedestrians and cyclists. This is not about being 
pro car owners, but it's about making our sidewalk more accessible to everyone. And with that, this hearing is. Thank you to the administration for the presentation. How one? I did want to tell you that we sent your staff and we copied you the bridge report, the link to our on our online bridge report that you asked for earlier. We just emailed it to your office. And I just think that with the bridge, it's important. I know that, you That's know, good. no question that you had the data, but I know in previous hearing on the bridges, usually the agency being able to say, yes, this is the list, is that we've been graded, and this is the data, and this is the third, the three worst bridges that we have where the city is right. putting more resources. Right. And I think that it's all about providing New Yorkers that information. Right. Not only for us to have it or to know that it is in the website, but yep. how people will be able to navigate. I just wanted to say we shot it over to your office right away. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you, administration, and we are Eric Maguire. And, and before Eric, it was here, good to, you know, get the data as we had before on how are we doing this year compared to the last year. So based on, on that information, what we've been told is by the NYPD that in 2018, we have a total of 201,471 collisions compared to 101,582 in 17. So there's been a slight increase However, when we look at the total of uh, people being killed in crashes, so far compared last year compared to this year, last year we had 206, and this year by this day we only have 175. Good news on the yes. deaths. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Eric McClure. I'm the Executive Director of Streets PAC. Thank you for the opportunity to share our thoughts on oversight of curbs and sidewalks this afternoon. Streets PAC would like to express its support for several of the measures under consideration today by the committee. We support intros 131 and 953, which together would place greater restrictions on the creation of curb cuts and compel the restoration of illegally removed curbs. There are likely thousands of illegal curb cuts citywide, many of which undoubtedly create unsafe conditions for pedestrians. We support requiring property owners to restore curbs where they've been illegally removed, as well as mandating community notification for planned curb cuts. Personally, as someone who tried in vain to oppose a neighbor's curb cut, implemented on a block that already had two existing curb cuts and for no other reason than the owner's desire to have a private parking space, I urge the committee to lend its support to this legislation. We also support intro 237, which would require the city to implement curb extensions at certain dangerous intersections. Curb extensions have been shown to significantly improve pedestrian safety, both by shortening the distance pedestrians must travel across an intersection and provide, by providing increased visibility through daylighting. Curb extensions are the type of treatment that should be a high priority under Vision Zero. Requiring the implementation of curb extensions at a minimum of five intersections in each borough annually would set the city on a plan to having a robust program for creating these important aspects of safety infrastructure. Additionally, we support intro 1956, which would require the city to paint curbs adjacent to fire hydrants and bus stops to alert motorists that they can't park, stand, or stop there. While drivers in New York City should be aware of the rules governing parking near hydrants and bus stops, it's clear from their behavior that many are ignorant or dismissive of the law. As much as the additional delineation of curbs will help drivers avoid parking illegally, it will also help police and traffic enforcement agents identify illegal parking and issue summonses accordingly. 
Too often, police and TEAs give motorists the benefit of the doubt, and since illegal parking creates safety hazards around hydrants and bus stops, we support any effort at more rigorous enforcement. One caution, however, we would vigorously oppose allowing drivers to cite absence of paint or the wearing of painted curbs as an affirmative defense in contesting a summons. We would urge that such language be included in an amended bill. This legislation should in no way be construed as a way of alleviating driver responsibility for parking illegally. Lastly, we strongly support Resolution 103, which calls upon the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to widen the multi-use paths across the George Washington Bridge. The planned renovations to the George Washington Bridge present a generational opportunity to increase access for pedestrians, runners, and cyclists who are using the bridge in ever-increasing numbers. The, D the GWB is the only walkable and bikeable connection between northern, northern New Jersey and New York City and now carries nearly 4,000 cyclists on weekends on a path that is among the narrowest bridge crossings in New York City. A widened path would also have tourism and resiliency benefits. Let's not miss this crucial opportunity to bring the George Washington Bridge's access into the 21st century. We urge the committee and the full council to pass this resolution without hesitation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end. And again, this coming Thursday at 1 p.m., everyone is invited to the, a joint hearing to get our committee of transportation together with the committee of sanitation education will be asking a lot of questions to the administration on how did we fail the day when we got six inches of snow and people, it took like hours and hours for a student with disability to get to the house, working class, senior citizen. So everyone is invited to be here this coming Thursday. We also would like to invite everyone to a hearing. We will come out a day later on that we're looking to have next week with the MTA to discuss the, the plan of moving forward. I also would like to take this opportunity to say that as the MTA will be holding a hearing today, the first one of our college or the proposal to increase the fare, I'm totally against it, increasing any fare before we look for any other sources or getting revenue. There's plan on the table, the plan congestion price, and increasing the contribution of the more wealthy New Yorkers. We should look into those plans. The Senate should go back to section in January, make those bills a reality, and not to get into the working class and middle class to deal with another fear increase. With that, this hearing is adjourned.